Today, we are going to be discussing how the NFL scouting combine will impact the New York Jets. Could the Jets finally find a trade partner if they want to move back at number four or if they want to move back at number 10? That's what we're talking about. Plus, in his weekly spot, a man who will be at the NFL scouting combine, Cole Thompson from Sports Illustrated, will join us to give us his take and, of course, answer your Jets and NFL draft related questions. So let's hit the theme song and let's do it. Hit it. Welcome in everyone. My name is Jake Asman. This is the Jake Asman show. The Jets just had one of their greatest wins in the last 20 something years and we're going to break it all down. Zach Wilson, Robert Sawa, CJ Mosley, Joe Douglas, Elijah Moore, Makai Beckin, Michael Carter, Braxton Barrios. A super chat, you cut the line. Smash the like button down below. That's that thumbs up icon. Now, let's talk about the New York Jets. <laughs> That's right. Time to talk about the Jets. And one of the faces that you saw in that incredible intro video is Cole Thompson from Sports Illustrated, who joins us right now in his weekly spot. And very on brand, he's slugging, he's chugging his cup of coffee to get ready for this weekly hit. Cole, as always, we appreciate the time. Unmute your mic. And let's dive into it, man. You're going to the combine next week. How are you feeling? Hey, guys. I'm uh, doing pretty well. You know, I'm very excited to be there. Get to talk to a bunch of different GMs. We'll be at Joe Douglas's and Robert Dallas press conference on Tuesday and Wednesday. So I'm going to be able to hear what they have to say. That way I can rely the information back to you, the fans who, who always chime in and give me a lot of good, good, good public praise on YouTube. And of course, right here and plus super chats. So I always can appreciate that kind of stuff, but it's been a good day. And uh, I love that you have Sam Darnold getting sacked in that promo. <laughs> that's, that's about as funny as me doing this, just literally like chugging one of these. And yes, I have a cup of coffee and I have my Celsius as I do every single morning, which is probably why my heart will explode in the next 10 to 15 years. Well, I hope you can get through this video and then we'll worry about the next 10 to 15 years, you know, sometime uh, after that. So let's start with this NFL scouting combine. You're going to be there next week. How do you think it impacts the Jets draft plans? And maybe not even just the Jets, but just how big is the combine in regards to the pre-draft process? I think it's massive in a lot of different ways. Let's just start off with the Jets and work our way forward. They know what they need to address going into the offseason. Cornerback is going to be one. Interior offensive line is going to be another. Potentially offensive tackle. They're going to need to get a premier wide receiver. They're going to need to be able to add some depth to the running back room. And there's a lot of talent that we did not see down in Mobile. And we have not seen for a couple months. Now get the opportunity to shine in front of the biggest showcase with all 32 scouts there. So there's a lot of players who we're talking about right now. A Drake London, who I have as wide receiver five, who very well with good measurables could end up being wide receiver two. A guy like Matt Corral, who we did not see whatsoever down in Mobile, could solidify himself as wide receiver number, I mean, quarterback number one for this class and potentially start having that conversation of moving up into the top 10 to select him. There's a lot of good offensive linemen in this class. And we got to figure out what is the pecking order of where they will go. And the edge class is once again loaded. But there's a few names that, of course, everyone wants to see. Quarterback is going to be one. The one that I am most interested in seeing is Kayvon Thibodeau. Kayvon Thibodeau, in my opinion, is the best player in this class. I see a lot of Daniel Hunter in this game. I see a lot of upside. I think that he could be one of the better pass rushers in the next three years in the NFL. Definitely not a Joey Bosa, Nick Bosa type player, but maybe a Jadavian Clowney type where they have the success, really good against run support, can add some value as a um, – as a passer, Trevon Walker, a guy who continuously is moving up draft boards. Guy was uh, sitting at me, what was it about? Um, like eighteen, like uh, like eighteen or twenty-two or something like that. And then he's already moved up into my top eleven. So if he continues to have a good day, I could see him going top ten. There's going to be a lot of different talent there, but it does kind of solidify what direction not only do the Jets want to go, but who are players that teams are willing to trade up to go get. So, Cole, you mentioned Kayvon Thibodeau, and that is a name that a lot of Jet fans want. There are some that are like, well, wait a second. Aren't there some concerns about his character? Or is he a diva? Is he Jamal Adams all over again? And to that, I'd say, well, Jamal Adams, when he was here, was an all-pro twice. So it's not the worst thing in the world if this guy has the ability of Jamal Adams at a premium position. 
But your thoughts on Kayvon Thibodeau and just how big this combine week coming up will be for him. It's a massive week for him because he's got to be able to show that he has the size, speed, agility, and work ethic, especially in those interview processes, which is something that we as the reporters, we as scouts, we as people who cover the draft will never be able to see. We'll only be able to hear what we know from front offices who are willing to talk to us. And there'll be a few teams that potentially I'll be able to reach out to and say, did you interview Kayvon? What did you think of him? There'll be a few teams that will basically tell me to go right away, and that's totally fine. That's just part of the process. But I kind of look at this very similar to how I looked at Panay Sewell and also Justin Herbert coming out. And it's funny that all three went to Oregon, but we overanalyzed Justin Herbert. I had Justin Herbert as QB2 on my board. I unfortunately had Tua Tungvaluwa as QB1, so I'll pick the L on that one. But I did have him above Joe Burrow because I thought that he was a bit more polished and ready to become a franchise-caliber quarterback right away. Yet he was the third quarterback taken. And in large part, that was because people overanalyzed. People thought, oh, well, he came back for a year. And his throw was a, was 0.28 seconds too late. Or his uh, his accuracy dropped from 69.8% to 68.2%. And people overthought that to let him fall to Los Angeles. And now he has two records that have not been broken. And potentially will never be broken for rookies and second-year players. The next year, Panay Sewell, one of the best interior offense. I mean, one of the best tackle prospects we've seen in the last I would go seven, eight years comes out. And there was conversations of him going number two, number three, number five. And he goes to number seven with the Detroit Lions, which actually ends up being a great move for them because of the one thing that you could say about Detroit, they have two franchise tackles on either side with uh, Taylor Decker on the left tackle and Panay Sewell, a natural left tackle, making the transition over to right tackle without ease. And there were people saying that he was going to fall out of the top 10. So I feel like we're getting right back into that conversation. We're getting right back into that mold where, oh, Pac-12, oh, you know, West Coast, oh, very lackadaisical. And then when the combine shows up, which we did not get last season for Panay Sewell, we only got his pro day, we're going to be able to actually see, you know what, we overanalyzed this. And I do think that even though he may not go number one, he could be in play for number two, definitely should be in play for number three. And if the Jets somehow find him at number four, I don't know how you don't run to the podium and get this guy to pair along with Carl Lawson and JFM. No doubt about it. Cole Thompson, let's go to this for a breakdown here. Give me your players to watch at the combine. You mentioned Thibodeau, so we covered him. But who really needs to go out there and show out next week to really help their draft stock? I'll go with uh, four players real fast. So I'll go Trevon Walker, the edge player out of um, out of Georgia. I absolutely love his game, and there's a lot of people now who are saying that he's going to be a top 10 player in this class. His physicality, his bend, his agility is something that, you know, is uncanny. And to be able to see that in person, three cone drills with working, you know, working drills, 40 time, all that, that's going to be able to take him from potentially a late first round pick to maybe a top 10 player, or it's going to maybe push him down draft boards to where they say he needs a little bit more work, probably going to be a late end of day one type player. Number two is Jalen Weidemeyer out of Texas A&M. The tight end class right now, we know what Trey McBride is. We know what Jeremy Ruckert is, but I still believe that overall, Jalen Weidemeyer is the second best tight end in the class, maybe even the best tight end in the class. He did not get to go down to the senior bowl because he was a junior leading Texas A&M. Needs to be able to show that he can continuously improve as an inline blocker. Needs to show his crisp route running. And the biggest thing of all is he has to be able to prove that last season it was just working with Zach Calzada, his quarterback, who only knew how to throw fastballs. He never knew how to have some touch or poise or accuracy on it. And he had a lot of drops. Like that was the biggest thing with Weidemeyer. He had a ton of drops. Is that because of the quarterback or is that because of Weidemeyer? If he has a good day, I solidify him as the number two tight end, probably a day two player, definitely in round two, early round three. Uh, next, I'm going to go Matt Corral. I think Matt Corral is the name to watch for because we know what Malik Willis' upside is. We know the consistency of Kenny Pickett, but Matt Corral may have a little bit of both. I look at both of his styles with his deep ball, with his, tra uh, his trajectory, with his passing, with his mobility, with all these things. And he may be a little bit more refined and polished than Malik Willis to where he could end up being QB1. He just has to show that on film, has to be able to show that the ankle injury that he suffered in the Sugar Bowl is not going to bother him. It's not going to limit his running style because that is a major part of his game, him moving in and out of the pocket to extend plays deep downfield. And the final guy I really want to see, Jaquan Brisker. I absolutely love Jaquan Brisker out of Penn State. I think that he could be a phenomenal safety at the next level. I have him as safety number two. But the question is, where does he fall? Is he a late round one or early round two prospect? And there's a lot of good safety depth in this class, especially at the very top end. Lewis Seen out of Georgia, Leon O'Neal out of Texas A&M, Kirby Joseph out of Illinois. But I really want to see what 
uh, a guy like Jaquan Brisker can do because if I do think that he has a hard hitting mentality and I also think that he could be your Jamal Adams as a round two player to where you don't have to really worry about drafting over or over analyzing a guy such as a Kyle Hamilton at number four. Cole, give me your thoughts on the quarterbacks here. Not that the Jets are going to take a quarterback, but in a perfect world, maybe the Texans trade back at three and then Thibodeau slides to the Jets at four. Maybe, just maybe, they get blown away with an offer at four and they feel like they need to move back. Maybe the trade down comes at number 10. But trade downs usually happen because teams fall in love with QBs. We keep hearing this is not a great quarterback class. That could change at the combine, though. Out of all the quarterbacks going to Indy, which one do you think has the – the, the greatest chance of increasing their draft stock at the combine. I think I said all three, and I'm going to continue to say all three. It is Matt Corral, it is Kenny Pickett, and it is Malik Willis. Willis, to me, has the best arm in the class. It's not even close. There's not even a second name out there. And I know that Carson Strong fans are going to say, oh, but Carson Strong has a good arm. Yeah, he does, but he also is wickedly inaccurate. And I don't think you can, t- you can teach that when he is so immobile and he's stuck inside the pocket. So that, to me, kind of takes him out of that conversation. But Malik Willis has the best arm. He just has to show that deep ball accuracy. That was his biggest flaw the last two years at Liberty. Big-time arm, big-time potential. If he has the accuracy, you have to be able to show that off. And if he does, he could be ending up starting week one, week two of next season. That's a big thing to watch for. Matt Corral, everything about his game speaks a little bit of Kenny Pickett and a little bit of um, uh, Malik Willis. A lot of mobility, like Malik Willis, a lot of accuracy, like Matt, I mean, like Kenny Pickett, but a better arm than Kenny Pickett, not as good as an arm as Malik Willis when it comes to deep ball. If he can show that consistency, that's going to put him in line to be a week one starter. And that's the big kicker when you're looking at trade-ups. You want to get a guy who's going to be able to contribute right away. A guy like a, like a Matt Corral going to Atlanta is going to be sitting on the bench for a year because of that contract that you have for Matt Ryan. He is going to be playing. So you have to be able to show, I can go in right away and be a day one starter. And then Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett is my QB1, and the only reason why, he's the most consistent. Accuracy, deep ball, touch, um, touch, uh, uh, vision, uh, decision-making. All these skills that you saw this past season, especially when he was working with Mark Will- uh, uh, Willop, uh, the offense coordinator who's now at Nebraska, when you watch what he did this past season, it was a complete night and day difference. Instead of worrying about the big time plays, he worried about the consistency. And at the NFL level, when you look at Joe Burrow, when you look at Mac Jones, when you look at even Davis Mills for the Houston Texans, one of the reasons why there's potential for all of them, and Joe Burrow, of course, being now a Super Bowl appearing quarterback, is their consistency. It's the fact that they made the right decisions at the right time. You can't teach that at all times. You can go ahead and try, but a quarterback has to be able to limit down the turnovers and worry about the consistency of moving the ball deep downfield and controlling the time of possession. All three quarterbacks, I do believe, could definitely move their stock up. If I'm going to bet on one, and I'm going to go on for a reach here, so you guys can hold me to it. And if, I, if I'm if i right, I, I hope to see a bunch of super chats saying, here you go, you were right, you need more money. I think Matt Corral has the best day there. I do. And I believe Matt Corral ends up solidifying himself as potentially QB1 and the first quarterback definitely selected. Probably going to be in play starting at pick number six for the Carolina Panthers. It seems like that's where the run on quarterbacks could maybe start. We had Tony Pauline on our show here in Houston the other day, and he goes, I'd be shocked if two go in the top 15. He doesn't think any are going to go in the top ten, uh, top 10. Thing is, though, Cole, teams always reach on QBs because of the demand at that position. Right now, how many do you think end up going in the top 10? I agree with Tony. I think one. I I think as of right now, going into the combine, one. And to me, that would be Kenny Pickett. I mean, that would be Malik Willis because of the upside. And Mm. the reason why I think you have Malik Willis in that conversation is because there's a team, the Denver Broncos, who are picking at number nine, who now have a head coach who was the offense coordinator of Aaron Rodgers the past two years in Nathaniel Hackett. They still have a quarterback on staff in Drew Locke. They can go ahead, try to run it back for a year, see what he does, see if he's able to do any bit of improvement. But what you're doing is you're getting a guy who has worked with a quarterback who put up great numbers in Green Bay, but then became a two-time back-to-back MVP as soon as Nathaniel Hackett entered the door. So you want to be able to have somebody who can work on those things. You want to be able to have somebody who has a good quarterbacks coach in the building. Because the one of the biggest reasons why Jock Allen has made that big transition from year one to year four 
is not just because of Brian Dable, it's because of Ken Dorsey, the quarterback's coach, who's now taking over as offense coordinator. His game was very similar to Cam Newton coming out, and Cam Newton's MVP season featured a quarterback's coach by the name of Ken Dorsey in 2015 working on the Carolina Panthers staff. So you got to be able to have the right quarterback's coach, but a good head coach with a good offensive mind and a great offensive coordinator who can help you elevate your game. When you look at a guy like Malik Willis, it does make sense for him to be in play for the Denver Broncos at pick number nine. I personally wouldn't go that way, but again, I definitely think that there's at least one quarterback. And then, then after the combine, let's talk. Could it be two? Could it be three? Could it be five? I mean, we don't we we really don't know until we see what happens after the combine. No doubt about it. If you're watching this live right now, we're going to open it up to see your comments, your Q and A. If you have a super chat, it goes directly to Cole as a thank you for coming on each and every week. And obviously, uh, you get to cut the line. So there's a bunch of you watching right now. Already a bunch of you have submitted some questions. Write them in in the chat box, and we will get to them as we go. Quick reminder, if you're just tuning in, if you're new to the show, if you like the Jets, if you like the NFL, if you like the NFL draft, and if you like America, hit the subscribe button on the right-hand side of your screen. And please do me a favor and support the show by hitting the thumbs-up icon down below. That's that like button. More likes and more comments. If you're not watching this live, that helps the channel continue to grow. Before we get to your Q&A with Cole Thompson, a quick word from our brand new sports betting sponsor. That's BUSR. BUSR is my official sports book, and it should be yours too. If you want if you want to bet on sports, if you want to play in the casino, if you want to bet on the ponies, you got to do it with BUSR. Sign up right now and double your deposit within the first 24 hours of signing up. If you deposit with crypto, you're going to get a 45% cash bonus on top of that deposit. BUSR is a weekly newsletter with the sports calendar of the week. Trivia to earn prizes, early lines, and free picks. Live betting, fast payouts, future wagering, live customer support. Everything you need for a sports book is at BUSR, and it's easy to sign up. BUSR.com slash Asman. BUSR.com slash Asman. Start betting on sports right now and sign up today at BUSR.com slash Asman. And make sure you sign up pretty quick because March Madness is coming up, and they have a bunch of really cool March Madness themed promotions coming up as we get closer and closer to the NCAA tournament. So thanks to BUSR for their support. Support them if you are looking for a way to bet on sports. BUSR.com slash Asman. With that being said, Cole, let's open it up. Comments, questions, super chats, cut the line. This one's from David to start us off. He writes in with a super chat, and then here's the question. Why are we talking about Walker from Georgia? Jeremiah got me worried about Thibodeau. He said he didn't add to his toolbox. So I guess David's asking, why aren't we talking enough about Walker from Georgia? Cole, this is a guy you mentioned, so your thoughts. I think the biggest thing is that you got to look at the entire defensive line. There's a lot of good talent on Georgia's defensive line that's coming out this year. I mean, let's just start off with a guy such as uh, Jordan Davis. I mean, there's a lot of people who said that he was going to be a top 15 pick but he only played like 33% of snaps because they only need him to play a one technique. So he's also very limited in a one gap. I mean, in a two gap system, probably as a three, four nose tackle, but Devontae Wyatt is really good. And then you have Trevon Walker and then um, I'm blanking on the third guy's name, but you also have linebacker play. That's really good. Nicobe Dean, Channing Tittle, and then you have Quade Walker. So the front seven of Georgia just was so dominant under Dan Lanning and um, uh, Kirby Smart this past year that you probably get overanalyzed. You don't really look at one specific player because they all work really well together fitting in their roles. But when I look at Trevon Walker, I see a lot of potential to his game. I see a lot of upside. I think that he is a better pass rusher coming out than any single one else on that defensive line at Georgia. I think that he has a ton of potential to be a double-digit sack artist. And he's going to be able to show really early on at the combine with his bend, with his speed, with his agility, with his uh, three-cone drill, all that other stuff, how dangerous he could be when he is a member of a different team as the lead defensive end. Because you got to remember, when you're playing on a team like that, it's a team effort. But when you're going up into the combine, it is a one-man show. And at Oregon, it was the Kayvon Thibodeau show. At Georgia, it was the Georgia defense under Dan Lanning. I mean, it was Georgia's defense, plain and simple, no matter how you want to put it. I mean, we're not even talking about De uh, uh, De uh, Darion Kendrick and Lewis Seen and Keely Ringo and Nolan Smith. I mean, we're not talking about these guys who also were contributors – because that's how good the defensive line was at Georgia. So part of the reason we're not talking about Trevon Walker is because if he's part of a unit, when you get him single individual, then guess what? You're going to be able to see what other scouts are seeing. And a guy like Dane Virgo at The Athletic is somebody who I trust with every single word when it comes to scouting in every single aspect. He has him as the number six player on his big board. And you're starting to see a lot of scouts 
follow that path. I, that, I, I have him, I think, at pick number 13 on my big board. And after the combine, he may be up in my top 10. So could he be in play at number 10? The Jets want to go pass rusher in that spot? Yeah, I, I don't see why not. I think it really matters on what you do at pick number four. If you go with a pass rusher at four, you're not going to double down on pass rusher. But at 10, yeah, I mean, I could honestly see it. And you're looking at Trevon Walker right now and Jermaine Johnson. They're probably both fighting for picks number four and five. And you're also probably seeing um, um, uh, David Ojabo out of uh, Michigan potentially maybe fall down that bit board. So there's a lot. I mean, there, there's a lot of different ways the Jets could go, but I do think that when you look at Trevon Walker, he actually fits a little bit better to that system than the David Ajabo. So for the Jets, you may not take, have him on your big board, even though I have him higher, but you may have Trevon Walker in play at pick number 10. Jay Perez says, how do scouts attribute the degree of importance to the combine exercises? What exercises are important? Which ones are useless? <sighs> I think the gauntlet drill is really useless at times. I mean, I there there's safeties who sometimes just don't know how to catch a football, and you're trying to go ahead and say, oh, well, they have to run in a straight line and make and make catches left and right. It really is based off position. I mean, a three cone drill for a defense, I mean, for a defensive lineman or an outside linebacker, is very important. A coverage drill for an outside linebacker is depending on what kind of system you're in. If you're an off ball linebacker, yeah, it's valuable. But if you're playing in a three four system as an edge player you're barely playing in coverage. Your job is mostly to do attack the pass rusher. So it really is based off a of position offensive line for 40 yard dash. The biggest thing that I look for is don't run like a five, eight. And you know, as long as you don't do that, well, then maybe there's something in play for you. Uh, I think that when you look at quarterbacks, there is a little bit of speed. I think when you look at all those kind of stuff, that's the factor that goes into it. It really is just kind of based off position. Some positions are going to need more. Like if you're a cornerback or you're a safety playing that coverage drill, you need to be very good in it because you have to be able to show your range and ability to cover deep downfield. If you're a quarterback, you need to be able to show off your deep ball accuracy. But if you're a quarterback, I don't really care what your three cone drill is. I that, that 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 to me is pointless. So it's a question that's really based off position. Uh, Waverton Jones wants to know how many holes do I think the Jets have overall? I mean, they were four and 13 Waverton, so they have a lot. Now there's some position groups that have more depth than others. I'll rank this by what their biggest needs are offensively. It's, it's a uh, tight end and wide receiver. They certainly could upgrade an O-line, but it's not like it's the biggest weakness on the team. So that's my, my big thing on offense. And then defensively safety pass rush and linebacker biggest needs corner you could say they could use another one sure but i don't think they're going to use a number four pick or a number 10 pick on that position so when i look at the defense safety is something i want them to fill in free agency call and then they need to still improve at pass rush which is why we had that conversation about you know Kayvon Thibodeau's there at number four run to the podium if you're the jets yeah um i would go with cornerback being a secondary need so basically if that's your bpa on your board to pick number 10 by all means go for it offensively i think you need a boundary wide receiver somebody who needs to play on the outside i think you need some depth that linebacker maybe you do need an extra linebacker to pair along with cj mosley you that need point. a safety but i think if you're going to take a safety go ahead and get him in free agency or get him in round two with one of your set with one of your two round picks you need a defensive end you absolutely need a defensive end and the good thing with jonathan franklin myers is you can shift him inside to play a four i tech so you really could have a good defensive line with Carl Lawson, with um, uh, with uh, JFM, with Quinn and Williams, and then whoever you draft at four or ten. I think that you need interior offensive line help more than you need exterior. I think if you're going to go ahead and try and run it back with George Fant, probably play him a tackle. Makai Becton, I think you have to play him a tackle. So if you want to go ahead and add an offensive lineman, Akeem Aquanu out of North Carolina State, Evan Neal, you can try him at guard. I definitely think that you can go ahead and figure that one out. And then a slot receiver. I think that you need to get a sticky slot guy Probably cut ties with Jamison Crowder after the season. If you can't re-sign Braxton Berrios, go and get somebody in the draft like a Calvin Austin out of Memphis or maybe a um, uh, a Bo Melton in round, th round four or five out of the Rutgers. Keep it going with your questions. Matt Morris, thoughts on Derek Deese Jr., his favorite tight end late draft pick? Well, his dad was a former offensive lineman, so you know that he's got some ability as a pass blocker. He does have good, really lengthy arms, which is great. Um, and he was at times San Jose State's leading receiver. I think he had three or four games of plus 100 receiving yards. So there's some potential there. I just view him as probably more of a tight end. Yeah, you are right. He's a tight end too. You're going to probably play him as a predominant blocker, maybe find a way to utilize him in the passing game uh, in the red zone inside the 20, inside the 30, something like that. Uh, but I see him as a day three player. I mean, I look at this tight end class. There's a lot of good talent at the very top end, and there's a lot of solid talent at the very back end. So I would not be willing to reach on a guy like Derek Deese Jr., but if he's available, let's say 
round five, round six. I need to fill a tight end position and I feel comfortable with my lead tight end. Go ahead and bring this guy in, not just for competition, but to also run 12 or 13 personnel. If you're watching this live, you got a question for Cole, submit it in the chat box. If you have a super chat, you cut the line, you go right to the front. And the best part about the super chats, they go directly to Cole as payment for coming on each and every week throughout the offseason. Cole's going to be in Indianapolis next week for the scouting combine. He was at the Senior Bowl. So if you have a draft question, a Jets-related question, you write it in, and we will get to it in the course throughout the course of this video. Let's keep it going here. This one is from Jiggs. Thoughts on moving up from 10 to 6. Carolina could use some extra picks, and the Jets would secure an elite defensive end and an elite tackle. So I guess this is based on the assumption the Jets would get Thibodeau at 4, and then maybe they want to get one of the tackles remaining at six. I don't see the Jets moving up in that situation, Cole, because they want to save their picks and just take really good players based on where they already are picking. But your thoughts on a potential trade up for the Jets at any spot? I don't like it at six. That's a lot. I mean, that, that's that's going to be a lot to move up. And it's not just going to be a first round. It's going to be a third round pick with it. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be pick number 10. It's going to be your third round pick. So you're not going to have a third round pick now. So you'll have two second round picks, which probably means you're going to have to trade one of those second round picks to go get a third round pick because you're not a team that can be comfortable not drafting in every single round or drafting in the early rounds or something along the lines of that. So I don't like it. I don't see a trade up. If anything, I see a trade back from four to six to where potentially you land a really good offensive tackle like a Charles Cross, maybe a Kima Kwan who's in play. Maybe Evan Neal somehow falls down the board. Uh, maybe at that point you do take Kyle Hamilton at pick number six, and I feel a lot more comfortable taking him at six than I do at pick number four. There's going to be some good defensive ends in play as well. There's going to be some good wide receivers in play as well. So I actually view it more so coming out backwards i think that you need to move back from four versus move up from 10 if we're going to go on that trajectory gain more picks i mean you don't have a pick after the i believe it's the fifth round so maybe you got to go ahead and have the pick of the sixth or seventh round just to be able to solidify having a name in the back end but that to me feels like a more much smarter option than giving up draft capital to go get a premier guy which by the way we don't know if they're going to be premier guys. We know what their trajectory could be, but it all also comes down to coaching. It also goes down to scheme fit. It also comes down to a lot of other things. So just because you're drafted top 10, and, and this is something that I have to say a lot of times to people, just because you're a top 10 player doesn't mean you're a top 10 prospect overall. And that also doesn't mean that you're going to be a top 10 premier player at your position over time. There's a lot of players who can absolutely move. And um, yeah, I, I view this if you're going to go tackle, you have options. If you're going to go guard, I think that you're limited to just two guys. Raymond says, hey, Cole, what do you think about the Jets going with Akeem at four, Jermaine Johnson at 10? They draft John Mechie in the second round and sign Allen Robinson on a one-year deal while Mechie recovers. I like it, but I would take John Mechie in the third round. That's just me personally. I think if there's better receivers right now who are healthier, who are going to be more available to you right away in round two with one of those second round picks to where a guy like Mechie maybe falls to the end of date, uh, maybe the end of round two, early round three. You can use that pick there to go ahead and solidify your off, uh, to go ahead and solidify your premier uh, perimeter outside receiver. I would rather do that. If you're going to take a wide receiver at pick, at pick 35 or pick 38, there's there's a lot better guys up there and a guy that i actually think that is going to blow up the combine and a guy that i haven't mentioned yet and i'm shocked i actually didn't is george pickens out of georgia the more i'm watching his film from 2019 and 2020 this is a first round wide receiver who just did not have the numbers this past season because of the torn acl he suffered in spring football i like him a lot more at pick 35 or pick 38 than mechi at pick 35 or 38 because number one he is going to be available week one for you. And number two, he may have even more upside than Mechie as that physical bona fide number one outside receiver. Orphanage says, question, in my opinion, Kenny Pickett's arm isn't impressive when he throws medium to long range passes. The ball seems to lack velocity, even 10 yard passes or less on the move. Look tough for him. Your thoughts on Pickett's arm, Cole? It is the weakest of the three that I've talked about. I'll give you that much, but it's the consistency factor that I look at. I don't think a lot of people are looking at like Mac Jones and they were talking about his arm. You know, it's also the offense that you were kind of catered to. Mark Whipple's offense was somebody who, you know, they wanted to go with the short to intermediate throws. They didn't want to go deep. And it's very similar to what you're seeing right now in, um, in, uh, New England with Josh McDaniels offense. They didn't want to go deep because they didn't have a deep ball wide receiver. Now, what I will say is I think Mac, Jar Mac Jones has a better arm than Kenny Pickett with the deep ball velocity, but that doesn't mean he has a bad arm. It just means to me, 
it's a very average arm. And when you have an average arm, something like a Kirk Cousins S, something like a Derek Carr S, you have to be able to master those little things. You have to be able to master the completion percentage, the QBR rating, the passer rating, the limited turnovers. You have to do all those things first before you go ahead and worry about the deep ball. So if you feel like you're comfortable in an offense that caters to that system, by all means, Kenny Pickett should be QB number one. And there's some and there's some systems out there where if you ask me, plug and play Kenny Pickett, can they win 10 games? I would say yes. And then there's some systems out there that say plug and play Kenny Pickett and can he win 10 games? And I'd say he'd be lucky to win three games. So that's the reality of it. It's also based off of offensive personnel. So Kenny Pickett's arm, it's very average. I'll give you that. I don't think it's below average and I don't think it's not um, unimpressive. It just is very average. And that's the reality of it. But when you look at the consistency factor of what he showed during his time this past year at Pitt, that makes the transition to the NFL a lot smoother than a guy who has deep ball, rocky can of an arm, but knows one speed. One of the biggest flaws with Josh Allen coming out of Wyoming, one speed, 75-mile 75, 75 fastball coming at you on a five-yard slant, 75-mile fastball coming at you on a four-yard deep ball. Like, you have to be able to fix that stuff. TA says, Cole, what are, your, what are the holes in Jeremy Ruckert's game? I see a six-foot-five, terrific blocker, excellent pass catcher that's perfect for the Jets' scheme. I don't know why they would pick McBride over Ruckert. Production. Let's just start with that. There's more production and more consistency for McBride as a pass catcher than there is with Ruckert. But again, you also have to understand the offense that was catered to a guy like Ruckert was more run zone based or wide receivers. I mean, go back and look at Ohio State's wide receiver core. I mean, there's two guys who who almost finished with a thousand yards as wide receiver three and wide receiver four. And there's a reason why Jamison Williams transferred from Ohio State to Alabama because of he couldn't get on the playing field with all these guys. I mean, you have Marvin Harrison Jr. finishing as your wide receiver four. And in the Rose Bowl, looked to be wide receiver number two in the country at the time behind his teammates. So, I mean, when you look at those kind of things, it's because of they utilize the offense differently. So that doesn't mean that Ruckert's not going to be effective. He was really good in red zone play. He's a really good blocker. But I look at his blocking skills. I think he is the best blocker in the class. But you got to remember, there is something that does come out of this. And that is, in my personal opinion, production. And when you look at a guy like Jalen Weidemeyer, he has better production as a pass catcher than Jeremy Rucker. When you look at Trey McBride, he has the best production out of any one of these guys than production. So when you look at those kind of things, you have to kind of separate it. This is a week for Jeremy Rucker to continue to show, listen, because of the offense I had to be catered to, I still can work. I still can actually be a really good tight end. But you have to be able to do that at the combine like you did at the senior bowl. Because he was a really good player at the senior bowl. But he really, really needs to show up at the combine. And if he does, round two, round three, absolutely he's going to be in play. Cole, I know you got 20 minutes left. So keep the answers as condensed as possible. I got 25. So we got time. All right. Well, if you got a super chat, you'll cut the line. But there's a lot of questions to get to. So I'm just going to rapid fire through as many as possible. George Thomas says, would the Jets consider Devin Lloyd in the first round? If you trade out a 10, yes, I would consider it. After you're saying a 10, no. And I love Devin Lloyd, and I think Devin Lloyd's a top 10 player in this class. I think he is my number 10 player. I I can't take a linebacker at pick number 10 when I have needs at every other position on the defense as well. So to me, this is a very good linebacker class where you can go round three, round two, get one. I, I'm not taking Devin Lloyd at 10. That's just not happening. Lucas says, first time I've, I'm watching your show live on the biggest Swiss Jets fan. It's on most of your videos. It's always fun. Great job. How about that? We got yeah. someone from Switzerland that is watching the show. Lucas, thanks so much for the kind words, man. Really appreciate it. Um, Chris says, do you think the Panthers tight end signing price will price the Jets out of the Schultz sweepstakes? Let me answer that call. No. No? <laughs> that will not. No? That will not at all. Um, all right. James says, Jake and Cole, do you think the Jets would put themselves in a financial situation if they just go ahead and pay Braxton Berrios? No, the Jets have money to re-sign them and then still sign plenty of other good players in free agency. They have top four in cap space, and that's before they make some more cuts to some guys like Greg Van Roten to save even more money. They have $48 million in cap space right now, and a guy like uh, Braxton Berrios is going to be like a three-year $18 million deal for an average of like $4.4 million a season. That's not even an in the cap space, including guys that they're still going to cut. That number is going to be over $50 million by the time free agency starts. No doubt. Uh, Joe says, what are your thoughts on Wandell Robinson as Debo Samuel Light, considering he's played running back and, uh, and in high school and at Nebraska? Would love him with pick number 69. So nice, but he also played for Kentucky, not Nebraska. So we'll just start off there. No, I, I totally understand, though, but – 
He's a Swiss Army knife. I see a lot more Curtis Samuel to his game more than Debo Samuel. So he's a guy that you're going to want to win on jet sweeps. He's a guy that's going to be able to use his legs in open field. He's a guy that you're going to be able to do like little quick screen passes to to work up field for an average of 13 yards per play. That's the type of player that you're going to get with a guy like a Wandale Robinson. I don't see that physical running style that you see with Debo Samuel who can be effective in the red zone. I see more of a Curtis Samuel, jet sweeps, quick pitches, stuff like that. And you got to remember that Scott Turner's offense, both in Carolina and Washington, has utilized that type of style. So if Wando Robinson goes to a team like that, if the Jets want to do that with Mike LaFleur and try to use him as a uh, uh, Curtis Samuel versus a Debo Samuel, I like the fit at 69. I really do. And he is a slot receiver, which is a really big upgrade for you guys, especially when you need that, of course, the middle of the field type of player. Ray says, and we always appreciate Ray. Yay, Ray. From the Dominican Republic, if the Jets draft a receiver at 10 or early in the draft, would you add Jamison Williams and at all in the later rounds, even if he starts the season on IR? Here's the thing, though, Ray. And Cole, you tell me if I'm right, if I'm right or wrong here. Williams is still going in round one because he was a top 10 prospect before the injury, and it's not like his leg needs to be amputated. He's got a torn ACL. Plenty of guys have come back from that injury and end up being just fine. I would be shocked if he goes past Buffalo Bills at 25. They need a speedster. They need somebody who can do it all. And he is a name that just automatically screams something that Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean kind of want for this. I want for this Austin Peril with Josh Allen and uh, and Stephon Diggs. That, to me, feels like his floor at 25. And, and honestly, there's going to be teams that want him probably even earlier. They, like, like the run on him is going to start at, six, at 15 with Philadelphia. And it's going to go through 25. No doubt about it. All right, keep it going here with your comments and questions. This one's from Terry. Jake, I'm a lifelong Jets fan, currently in Northeast Ohio, and I just saw a Raisin Canes for the first time. Ooh. How fast should I get there? Terry, you will go to Raisin Canes, and it will change your life. That has been by far and away one of the best parts about living here in Houston almost the last four years. Being from New York, I never had Raisin Canes in my life, Cole. And the first time I had it, it changed my life. It's the greatest chicken fingers you will ever consume. Am I right or wrong? So in high school, we did not have until my junior year. And every single time after a football game, we would go to Raisin Cane's. Like that was our go-to place. I probably have Raisin Cane's twice a month, if that. I mean, if not more. The sauce is great. The crinkle fries are great. The way the breading of the chicken is fantastic. Get yourself some Raisin Cane's, Terry. I'm serious. I will find myself in Northeast Ohio and make you go get Raisin Cane's for me, brother. We are getting Raisin Cane's. It's that good. It's legit. Let me, it's legit. Let me give you a tip, uh, Terry. Replace the coleslaw with extra fries or extra Texas, Texas toast. All right? So that's the move. So you get the Cadillac combo, which is the biggest order. You're going to get that. You're going to get the six tenders. Make sure you ask for some extra cane sauce on the side as well because they might stiff you on it. So you want to make sure that you substitute the coleslaw because who the heck wants coleslaw and get either extra fries or extra Texas toast. You'll thank me later. What did you call it? Coleslaw? No, 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 no. What, what, what kind of combo? Caniac. Caniac. Oh, Caniac? Caniac. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Caniac, yeah. That actually would make Kaniac more sense. Combo. Yeah, that would make more sense considering it's called Cage. Yeah, the Caniac combo. <laughs> My point stands, Terry. My point stands. Sam L says, Cole, favorite wide receiver prospect outside the top group, level of faith in prospects like Jamison Williams or Chris Olave. So I'm very high on Chris Olave. I think I'm higher than most people on Chris Olave. He's my wide receiver three. I like his ability to extend plays deep downfield. I think that he is a really good route runner. I think he has the ability to take the tops off of defenses. So that's a guy that I'm really high on. Jamison Williams, he's wide receiver four, and he probably would have been wide receiver two if he would have been healthy, but because of the health and the injury, and we don't know when he's going to play, that kind of takes him out of that conversation as well. So probably wide receiver four. Favorite wide receiver outside the top group. That's really tricky. Um, I will say George Pickens to me is a guy who is moving into that top group. I love George Pickens' game. And I do think if you go look at his 2019 and 2020 film, he's that physical receiver that you really, really want to win in those contested battles. If I had to go a little bit deeper, I like two guys. I think Calvin Austin out of Memphis is a really sticky guy who you can play in the slot, make a lot of good plays, make a lot of defenders miss. Kind of what Anthony Miller was supposed to be when he was coming out of Memphis. And then I really like Bo Melton. I think that Bo Melton, he can be used as a gadget type player. And when you look at a guy like Rondale Moore and how they utilize him or Curtis Samuel on how they utilize him, the game is starting to want to get these type of players. They want to be able to add players who have – uh, a lot more than just one trick pony value. So these are two guys that I think can be available on day three and absolutely be contributors day one for an offense. 
George wants to know, speaking of wide receivers, could Chris Olave fall to the Jets at 35? No. I mean, no. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, and if he does, that's an absolute steal, run to the podium and never look back kind of thing. But I would be very shocked if he's not the pick for the New England Patriots at pick, at pick 21. They need to get a deep threat. I would not be shocked if they want to go utilize him in Las Vegas, kind of what they were supposed to do with Henry Ruggs before – the tragedy, and you add in a guy such as Josh McDaniels as your head coach, you can fit that offense very well to Derek Carr. He's going to be in play. I mean, he is going to be in play no matter what round one, and I do not see him falling outside of 25. Anthony says, what do you think we'd have to give up if we took Amari Cooper's contract off the Cowboys' books and get the 24th pick of the draft to get our third first rounder, maybe for either McBride or a wide receiver at 24? You're giving up a lot. I mean, you're, I, I don't see how you get Amari Cooper and pick number 24. Like, like right. that's the thing. Like, you like, get Amari like, Cooper. You, yeah, you can get Amari Cooper for maybe like a third round pick because they're trying to free cap third and fifth, Third and fifth or something like that. Or maybe maybe a third and a 2023 20, fourth or something like that. I mean, like that, like that maybe happens. Or if you want, give them one of your second round picks, just one of your second round picks. Like that would be it. But I don't see a way to where you're getting 24. You have to offer them something that they need. Like, you would have to offer Makai Becton for pick number 24. And I just don't see the Jets giving up on, on Becton. Like, there's no way you're getting 24 and Amari Cooper in a deal. I tend to agree with you. Uh, Jared says, I'm late. I didn't get the live notification. That's okay, Jared. We appreciate you hey, watching. Jared. Uh, what are your thoughts on Alec Pierce? Big wide receiver, six foot three, was a go to weapon for Desmond Ritter this past season in the perimeter. Round three, round, like early, mid to late round three type of guy. Uh, probably can be a good red zone target. Probably can be a good possessional receiver. Needs a lot of work, but I really, really do like uh, his upside. I just don't like him as a top 10 wide receiver, which, again, speaks tremendous volume of this wide receiver class. No doubt about it. Let's keep it rolling here. Cole Elliott says, how do the Jets approach the O-line of free agency? Do you spend money on a starting guard when Akeem might be your pick in the draft? What if Akeem turns out to not be available? I mean, I think that you could always take a guard. If I was going to be somebody to go with one, James Daniels from the Chicago Bears is a name that I think a lot of people kind of are sleeping on. He's a really good run blocker, and he's graded out by Pro Football Focus as one of the better interior pass protectors over the past season. I know Brandon Sheriff's name has been linked to the Jets for a little bit. I personally don't like it. If you're going to go with an offensive lineman, I would potentially go Alex Kappa from the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's a good pass protector. He was able to help stabilize the run support with Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones the past two seasons. So there's a lot to like about that, but I do think that you still need to get an offensive lineman somewhere in, in play. But if you're going to go with an offensive lineman in the in free agency, I would go with a younger guy. I would honestly go with a younger guy versus an older guy who's a little bit more proven, like a Brandon Sheriff, because a Sheriff maybe is there, but he's only there for three or four years, and then you're gone, and you would rather have a guy who maybe you bring back on a second contract afterwards. Siegel North, super chat. He cuts the line. There's so many questions, so I suggest that you contribute to the Cole Thompson Fund, a.k.a. a super chat. Uh, where do you see linebackers Damone Clark and Leo Chanel on your draft board? So Clark is LB9 for me. Chanel is LB10 for me. So they're right there at the back end. I think that both of them are probably going to be in play mid to late down three. Uh, I would probably go somewhere around there. Linebackers, when I look at Clark, I think he's a bit of a more thumper. When I look at Chanel, I view him more of about, I think he can play a Mike or a strong side linebacker, really good against run support. I think he's not a bad pass coverage guy, but he's not that same level as like a Devin Lloyd or maybe even a um, – um, uh, uh, and a Kobe Dean or a Quay Walker. Good, good. Both are good players. I know a lot of people at PFF, trust me, I've already seen the mocks. Uh, PFF, they love Leo Chanel. They have him as like the number 31 player on their big board. So wow. maybe he goes a lot higher, but I have him right now as linebacker 10. Damon Clark is linebacker nine. Rise of the New York Jets says, do you think Chad Muma is the linebacker uh, from Wyoming is a top 50 pick? Do you think Muma can fall to the Jets in the third round? Talk to me after the combine because Moom is a guy that I actually have as linebacker four, and I think that he may end up being linebacker three. He reminds me a lot of Logan Wilson, his former teammate at Wyoming, but he's a lot better in coverage. I mean, he has really, really improved in coverage, and I do think that he is a name that continuously is moving up draft boards because of that ability. And you got to remember that there's going to be a lot of teams out there that want to have linebackers who can cover tight ends, cover running backs out of the backfield. Muma showed that in the Mountain West this past year. He showed that down at the Senior Bowl. If he can do that down in Mobile, it's going to be really hard to see him get, seeing him get out of the second round. So 
maybe he'll be in play at three. But honestly, right now, I feel like 38 is probably where you're going to have to take him if you are a Jets fan or trade back to be able to play it up. Cole, I think you're going to like this comment. In regards to the conversation about Canes, Green Truth says he had Canes when he was in Dallas. Good stuff. And if you're ever in Dallas, find a Torchy's Tacos. Hey, Green Truth, if you're ever in Houston, find a Torchy's Tacos. We got them everywhere, baby. <laughs> They're in Texas. Dude, I, I was say, the first time I had Torchy's Tacos, I was 14 years old. We had to drive up to the one off of Shepherd up here from the Woodlands. So an at like an hour, 15 minute drive. And I kid you not, it was the best meal I ever. It was like the best meal I had at 14. And they finally added one of my hometown. I go to the Torchy's up here probably once a month. Torchy's is amazing. There's a Torchy's about two minutes from where I am right now. I could walk there if I really wanted to. Yeah, there's about, there's one about seven minute drive for me. Torchies is great. Uh, Joe Asspipe, what a name. And this is definitely not his real name, but I respect it anyway. Jake, you're the best. Keep hammering the competition. Thank you, Asspipe. We appreciate it. Uh, Jake Ray's... is a Pittsburgh Maulers fan. That's what he is <laughs> in the USFL because he, that... he's hammering away. There you go. Uh, Ray says, Cole, are you coming on the show next Friday from the Combine? Also, let's hit the like button for Jake and Cole people. That's right. Smash the like button down below, folks. we got 226 of you watching live right now. I don't know if I will be available for the combine next week. We're going to have to kind of figure it out uh, based off of interviews, based off of uh, contacts, based off of, uh, you know, conversations like that. Because of once the combine starts, you know, you have interviews with players, you have interviews with GMs. I will do everything in my power. And if not, what I will definitely do is I will come on as soon as the combine is done, recap it, and then be back that next Friday. So you may have me not next week, but it'll be two top times in two weeks. Yeah, we'll, we'll work on the schedule. I'm, we'll, we're yeah. going to get Cole on and, and get his full thoughts on the combine. And, and make sure you follow him on Twitter, too, because he's going to be live tweeting his thoughts in real time as everything is unfolding. So hey, the link to his Twitter account is in the description. At Mr. Cole Thompson is where you could follow him. And same thing as last week. If you follow Cole, if you're one, one of the first 100 people to follow Cole on Twitter, Cole's going to send me a list of everyone who followed him, and I'm going to add your name to the list because at the end of the month I'm giving away – free swag so follow cole and if you don't follow me on twitter and instagram it's in the description as well at jake asmus where you can follow me and more and followers I cole. yeah no cole sent me the list and i added all the names that uh that followed him so give cole a follow if you want his uh combine thoughts in real time um all right, and i message see- back I, I do message back so you can always message me on twitter and i will always respond there's two guys in this track who is who i know are messaging me George says, should the Jets be interested in Drake London? Does he fit the LaFleur offense? A lot of Drake London at number 10 mock drafts, Cole. Yeah, he fits. I mean, he absolutely does. And he's a good contested receiver catcher, but he doesn't have that separation that I really want, like a Garrett Wilson. And I saw in the comments last week, someone like say, oh, come on, Cole. Like you're, you're sleeping on him. We already have that guy. We don't need a Garrett Wilson when he's more of like a uh, Elijah Moore. No, Elijah Moore is Deontay Johnson and Garrett Wilson is more Stephon Diggs. You would love to have a Deontay Johnson and Stephon Diggs is your one-two combination on the outside. I do like Drake London. I, I'm very interested to see what Drake London does this next week because, again, you got to remember, he suffered the knee injury, but even without the full season, led the FBS in contested catches. So there is a lot of upside for a guy like Drake London, and I definitely think that he will be in play for wide receiver number one. After this week, I'm going to have a really good feeling of where he sits. He's wide receiver number five on my board. Could be wide receiver number two by the time the combine's over. Super chat from Corey. He cuts the line. Corey, I should have got to this before the last question, but unfortunately, I just saw it now. Trade pick 10 and Mims for this with the Saints for Michael Thomas. I wouldn't. I mean, I I I I just I, I'm not gonna deal with Michael Thomas's issues right now. And again, you gotta remember that Michael Thomas, even if he wants out, they're gonna probably want more than just 10. They're gonna probably want second round picks and third round picks because this is a team that does not have a lot of draft capital either. So they're going to want probably more of your mid-round selections than early selections because you got to remember, they're a team that could still be contending in the NFC South if they get the right pieces in, but they're hemorrhaging in cap space, and they need draft capital to be able to build around the offense for Pete Carmichael and new head coach Dennis Allen. So 10 and Mims doesn't make sense for Michael Thomas. They, they would more so be second-round pick, third-round pick, and Denzel Mims for Michael Thomas because they, they would want picks more than anything else. Ron Dooley is a fan of Brandon Eccles last year. Go Brandon. He actually spells his name B-R-A-N-D-I-N, but Brandon Eccles, Cole, sixth-round pick, played a lot for the Jets. You look at there, Joe Douglas has done a really good job at drafting day three corners, whether it's Bryce Young in 2020, who's Mm -hmm. a really good player on this defense now. Obviously, Michael Carter, the other Carter that plays in the secondary, he played well as a rookie, and Brandon Eccles flashed at times as well. That's why I don't think corner is going to be a need they use a top 10 pick on. 
They could sign a veteran in free agency, and they could take another swing on a guy uh, in day three because it's worked the last couple of years. You have to be able to have a bona fide number one cornerback. And if you don't address in free agency, yes, it's going to be in play at number 10. But I actually went back and I watched a lot of Michael Carter's film this past year. He was really good at sign. He was, he was really, really good at sign. I was very shocked about that. Outside of the one play against Henry Ruggs that he got burnt, he had a really, really, really solid year. So I actually think that the cornerback position is not a major need. It's just if he if there's one available like a Sauce Gardner and that's your number one player on your board, you didn't sign anybody in free agency. Go ahead and add him. But besides that, it's it's just saying they're a need. No doubt. Uh, Show enough Madden wrote this in. There's 204 people in the chat and only 65 likes. It's simple. Take Ron Middleton's advice and hit it. Well, we got more in the chat now. Hopefully, we got more likes. But I know what you want, Show. You want to hear Middleton? I'll give you Ron Middleton. Moves. Hit it. If it don't move, hit it. And if you're not sure, guess what? Hit it. Yeah. Cole, if you're running to Ron Middleton, tell him to come on the Jake Asman show, okay? I will do that, actually. And I will I will tell him that there is a there is a guy named Jake Asman who has over 12,000 followers. Congratulations to Jake. We got to get that up, though. We got to get to like 15,000 for Ron Middleton to come on. So make sure you hit that <laughs> subscribe button because if you don't, not only do you hate the Jets, you hate America, you hate Ron Middleton. And maybe, just maybe, I'll get him to say, hit it. And that way you can call him the show. Dude, just go up to him and be like, hit it! And see, see how he reacts. Uh, Dustin Keller's watching. Former Jets tight end. The last time the Jets had a good tight end, it was Dustin Keller. He says, regardless of where uh, we would have to draft, which running back from the draft class would you like to see paired with Michael Carter? I like two. And I've been very high on both these two for the Jets for a while. Number one is Jerome Ford out of Cincinnati. I really like his upside. I think that he has a good balanced running attack when going through the trenches. But what's really interesting is how he gets to that second and third level of defense with his speed and agility. He's also a really good pass catcher out of the backfield. Last season averaged 10.2 yards per reception. And then Damon Pierce. Damon Pierce is that physical burly runner from Florida. Got the size, got the agility, but is really good at pass protection. And you got to understand when you have a young quarterback like Zach Wilson, as much protection as possible is key. That's why I always say build with the offensive line. That's why I always say make sure that you have st stability in your front line. Make sure you have stability in your backfield. A guy like Damon Pierce is not going to allow linebackers to get any pressure on Zach Wilson. Carmelo says Drake London's style of play is awkward. Do you agree with that, Cole? I need to see more of it. I mean, like, I I really need to see more of it. And that, like, that's what the combine's going to be is when he goes up and drills. Is he going to be able to create separation? Is he going to be able to reach the high point of the attack? I think a lot of people are like looking at that ankle injury and going, oh, well, he's going to be, you know, in trouble because of that. It's more so just he doesn't have the separation like a guy like Garrett Wilson has. So that to me is more so where I'm in that conversation of why Garrett Wilson versus why Drake London at pick number 10. I want separation. I want a guy who can win at the point of the attack, but also can win by getting away from the cornerback. Drake London has that contested catch theory. He doesn't have that separation theory. Jig says, Cole, how similar is Jahan Dotson to Elijah Moore? Could Mike LaFleur use both of them? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're similar. I, I, I've actually gone back and I've kind of thought back through my mind on this one. Jahad Dotson does remind me a lot of Deontay Johnson and does remind me a lot of Elijah Moore. He can play the outside. I would rather play him inside. But yeah, you can always utilize him. I mean, if you want speed and you want guys who can get yaks after you, you know, yaks after the catch, by all means, go ahead and get it. But I personally think that you need to go get a bigger receiver and a guy who can take the top off of defenses, maybe more downfield. 15 to 22 yards versus a guy like Elijah Moore who's going to win in that short intermediate game. Are you as high on Elijah Moore as Jeff fans are? Because we love the guy. We love the pick, and he was great as a rookie when he played. He was a first-round talent last year. I was no, You and I did a live show. We did a live show on Sports Map Radio, and the second that he got drafted, I texted you, you son of a gun, how the heck does he fall to you? Because he should not have been there. He should have been a pick in, for, in the first round, hands down. But, yeah, well, the best part about Elijah Moore's story is the Jets had him as their 16th best player on their big board. They were going to take him at pick 23. But then they made the trade to get Elijah right. Vera Tucker, and they, th they thought, well, we're not going to be able to get him. He's going to be off the board. And when he was there at number 34, they were shocked. So they got the guy they wanted all along anyway. I mean, the way that I kind of look at it right now also is like when you see Jacksonville, they really wanted Kadarius Tony. It was a very obvious thing that they wanted Kadarius Tony to be that slot receiver. Why not just go get Elijah Moore? He's not as elusive, but he still is a really good player. And did you see that wide receiver core in, in Jacksonville as soon as DJ Chark went down? Garbage. I mean, absolute 
garbage. I don't know how he fell because if he should have been in play for New Orleans, he should have been in play for um, for Green Bay, he should have been in play for Jacksonville. The fact that he fell to 16, I mean, to be the 16th player on their board and go to 34, absolute fantastic move. And it's kind of why I give a lot of credit to Joe Douglas for last year's draft. James says, Jake, love the intro to your show. I love how you had Mike McCagden's face X'd out next to Joe Douglas. That was all the work of the great Stan the Man. For those who like the intro, and I love it, he did an amazing job with it. If you want him to design your intro or your graphic design for any of your projects, reach out to me and I could share his contact information with you. Uh, he did it free of charge. I tried to offer him money. He didn't want it. He's a big fan of the show, Stan the Man, and we really appreciate uh, his support and the incredible intro that he made. So, if the least I could do is bring in some business for him. So if you need an intro design for your show or anything graphic design related, you let me know and I can put you in touch with Stan the Man, the phenomenal graphic designer that made the intro video that you now see at the top of the show. Um, Matt Morris says, Jets, number one YouTube channel right here for sure. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. And I'm thankful for a guy like Cole coming on every week to add credibility to this channel. Rise of the New York Jets wants to know, do you think Boy Mafe is a first-round pick? He could be. I mean, he very, he very well could be. A lot of things that you saw down in Mobile makes him look like he could be a first-round pick. I really want to see how his three-cone three, three cone drill is. I want to see how his agility is. I want to see what his speed is in the 40-yard dash. He's probably in that range of edge number six, edge number seven, maybe edge number eight. I probably view him more as a second-round pick. But there's some people who have who have started mocking him late first round, and I would not be shocked to see him get go on day one. Uh, this one's from George. Should Jermaine Johnson be ahead of George Karloftis? No. Uh, and maybe that's just me. Uh, I really like what George Karloftis offers. I think that what you have to do is you have to get him in a defense like a Robert Sala defense that's going to be able to help him become a better pass rusher because he's really, really, really good against the run, which is going to be able to help you out a ton if you have a guy like Carl Lawson get 10, 12 sacks a year, you'd be able to pair him. But I've said this multiple times. I see a lot of Trey Hendrickson into his game. What you have to be able to do is you have to be able to get him in a system to where he's going to be able to improve as a pass rusher. I look at a guy like Jermaine Johnson. I think that there's a lot to like about him, but the upside of Carl Loftus, especially in run support, makes him to me a more quality day one starter versus anyone else. Cole's got to run in a minute or two. So if you got a super chat, got get it. Seven minutes. Uh, seven minutes? All right. Well, great. So if you got a super chat, there's a lot of questions still to get to. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. But if you have a super chat, we will definitely get to it, including this one here from Tony. So he cuts the line. If you take a wide receiver one in free agency or through a trade, what position would you draft at pick 10? Uh, I would go cornerback potentially, depending on if you don't address it in free agency. I would be willing to go odd. I would probably go edge defender if you're going with a uh, tackle at pick number four. If you go edge at pick number four, I would go tackle at pick number 10 or interior offensive lineman. I definitely think that there's a lot of different ways you can go. But if somehow, I mean somehow, Kyle Hamilton falls to pick number 10, which I don't see happening, but let's just say he does. There's no reason why you don't draft him. Like, there's absolutely no reason. There, there's people out there who say he's the number one player in the class, and for good reason, because there is a lot of upside with him, and there's a chance that he could be the best player. At 10, I don't hate the pick. I just, I cannot, no. for the life of me, pick him at four. I just can't do it. Trade back at six, I'd be okay taking him. Trade back to eight, I'd be okay taking him. Just not at four. That's the problem. Ron writes in, guys, how great would Williams from Bama look for us? I mean, Cole, you're an Alabama alum, so there's no one more qualified to talk about Jamison Williams than you. Roll Tide. He'd take the top off of defenses. He has that speed. He has that home run threat. But where are you taking him? Because I'm not taking him at 10. I, I'm just, I'm not taking him at 10 when there's more players out there who are going to be day one ready. If you're willing to trade maybe your second round pick and a fourth round pick to move up to the late end of round three and have three first round picks, by all means, do it. But if you're not going to do that, I just don't see how he's going to do it. Appreciate the super chat there, Ron. Thank you. The super chat's coming in from Jared. Is David Ajabo the hardest player to project in this draft? He's the hardest out of the edge players to, to project in this draft because there's so little tape on him. He only played one full year as a starter for Michigan. A lot of people thought he was going to come back, hone his craft, and be a top five player. A lot to like about him. I mean, an absolute ton to like about his, his spin move, his uh, quickness off the football, his ability to disrupt the pass rush and get in the backfield and chase down quarterbacks. But there's a lot of raw potential to his game. I do think that he has tremendous upside, but also is he going to be able to play in a 4-3? Is he going to be limited to a 3-4 from a standing linebacker perspective? Where does he best fit? What is his role? 
that is the problem. And, and again, I've seen people rank him as high as edge number three. I've seen people rank him as low as edge number eight. So it's one of those things where he's the toughest edge player to go for. That's for sure. Anthony says, if we sign Dalton Schultz, I am willing to miss out on McBride and grab another need in the second round and then draft Jeremy Ruckert in the third. Where does Ruckert end up, Cole? Is he a second-round guy? Does he actually make it to the third round? It's a really good tight end group, and everyone has mixed opinions on where everyone stacks up. After the combine, I'll know a little bit more. Uh, I would probably say right now he's a mid to late date round two player, early round three. But if he has a really good combine and continues to show what he did, especially because if he's a great inline blocker, he's going to go early. He's going to be a top 50 pick hands down. So it's really something along the lines of that. Here's the thing, and I've told you guys this before and I'll continue to say it. I'm not reaching for a tight end. There's a lot of good tight ends in this group. Greg Dolchich out of UCLA. I like Charlie Kohler as an upside player out of Iowa State on day three. I think if there's Jeremy Rucker, you have um, uh, you have Jake Ferguson out of Wisconsin. There's a lot of good talent at the tight end to where I do not feel crazy enough to reach on a player like that. Raw power with kind words. Love all the Jets content creators, but Jake Asman shows on another level. Thank you, Raw Power. Professional sports show. Need to get you on New York radio. Maybe one day, Raw Power, I started my career at the fan in New York as a producer, and uh, they don't just give those jobs out to anybody. So I moved to Houston, and I got my own show down here, and maybe one day I'll be back in New York. But appreciate your support, Raw Power. Thank you. George wants to know, Cole, should the Jets sign DJ Chark? Depending on the price. I mean, this is a guy who's coming off of a, a season-ending ankle injury at, at, at very early on in the season. But I saw someone comment earlier that uh, DJ Chark is like a good clone for like Christian Watson. No, he's not. Uh, DJ Chark runs a 4-3-40, is tremendously a great vertical threat. Before the injury last year, he was averaging 22.2 yards per reception. So he was that vertical option. If you can sign him for a really good deal, by all means, I would absolutely go for it. But you also got to make sure that it is a cost affordable deal because the last thing I want to do is overspend on a wide receiver who's probably better as a number two, but give him wide receiver one money. Spin Max Dave wants to know what you think of Donovan Bam Knight, the running back from NC State. So Zonovan Knight is his name from NC State, but I love that you, that you called him Bam. Um, I think he's a great player. I really do. I think that he has a bunch of trajectory to him. I think you can use him as a Swiss Army knife. He is physical in the trenches. He is a good route runner. He is good with his pass catching hands. A lot of James White to his game, a little bit probably, um, probably maybe even a little bit more than than James White. Probably there's a lot more to like about him. Um, but I would probably say he's about a round three, round four type of guy. Definitely a player who is moving up draft boards. And I was very excited to see him this past year at NC State. I thought that he was actually going to be one of, if not the number one running back in the ACC this past year. Uh, Ron wants to know, who the hell wants to come back to New York these days? Well, Ron... Uh, if you grew up a New York sports fan, it would make sense that if your friends and family still live in New York, you might want to do sports radio there at some point in your career. But I appreciate you watching. Um, all right, Cole, a couple more here. We'll get you out of here. If you got a super chat, last chance to submit it because Cole is going to allow you to cut the line with any super yeah. chat. We uh, got about three minutes, guys. So This one is from Gabriel. Romeo Dalves, thoughts on him, Cole? This is the wide receiver from the Nevada Wolf Pack. Over 1,100 receiving guards last year. Senior, 80 catches, six foot two. I like him a lot. What are your thoughts? If you get him at 69, I'd be very okay with it. I think he's about a round three player, can take the tops off of defenses. It's a very good route runner. The biggest thing you got to remember is that Jay Norvell's offense was very air raid system, so it was a lot of deep vertical passes downfield. And it's why a guy like Dubes and Cole Turner, the tight end, both had higher numbers than most players because they were always getting targeted 15, 18, 23, 24 yards down the field. It's all about value for a guy like him. I would love to see him in a Jets uniform for the right value pick. And to me, it makes sense at 69, anything higher, if he's going to go, I just would kind of pass on him. There, there's a lot of good receivers to where I don't think you need to reach either. Siegel North, who is better suited for the Jets offensive line, Kenyon Green or Zion Johnson? So I saw somebody earlier talk about taking Kenyon Green at pick number 10. That's a little bit of a reach for me. I like both. I think better suited is Zion. I think that he is a probably more efficient run blocker, and he also has a little bit more skill set to be able to play that tackle position if need be. He actually played tackle in 2020 for this run, uh, for the for Boston College. So there's a lot of different ways you can – oh, sorry. You, you, there's a lot of different ways you can utilize him, and I do think that he would be one of these versatile scheme fit type of players that Michael LaFleur would love to have. I don't see a problem with either guy, but if you're asking me right now, who would I take if I'm like pick 35? I think Zion has a better shot of falling to you versus a guy like Kenyon Green, who I do think is not going to make it out of the first top 25 picks. 
Cole, before we get out of here, tell everyone what you have coming up. You're going to be at the NFL Scouting Combine in Indy next week. Everyone's got to follow Cole on Twitter at Mr. Cole Thompson so you can get his live tweets and live coverage from the Combine. What's on? What, what's in store? How can people follow along with your written work at Sports Illustrated? Follow me at fannation.com. You can go check me out on multiple different websites. I'll tweet out my links to all my articles. That starts at at Mr. Cole Thompson. Go ahead, at Mr. Cole Thompson. I am Cole Thompson. I am a mister. It's that simple. See a name with the blue check mark. That's me. Go ahead and give me a follow. I see one more super chat real fast. Thoughts on Jalen Tolbert. I like him as wide receiver number seven. Good size, good speed, good agility. Was a really nice find. Really talented player this past year for uh, the Jaguars offense. I think he's a late round two, early round three player. Definitely would make the Jets a lot of sense if they were going to move off Corey Davis after this season. So we'll just go ahead and add that in there. But yeah, at Mr. Cole Thompson on Twitter, give me a follow. If you message me privately, guess what? 95% of the time, as long as you're not an a-hole, I will respond to you. So go ahead and give me a follow. Give me a message. I Trust me, there's a lot of people in this group chat who I know message me all the time and ask me, what are my mock drafts? What are this? What are that? I always am want to talk to you. Go ahead and give me a follow at Mr. Cole Thompson on Twitter. And you can always check out my great written work at fannation.com slash uh, whatever team you're kind of looking for. Yeah, Fan Nation is the site through Sports Illustrated. So, Matt, you got the super chat in just in time. And you know what? Ron's got one more, Cole. We all super chats must get answered. Those are the rules. Ron wants to know, will any team call the Jets about Mike White? Mike White! I want that guy. I, I don't. I don't know, dude. I, I I really don't know if they will. But man, I will never forget the legend of Mike White. There. The, what's so funny is that they were so bored on New York Jets media one day. They're like, should they trade Zach Wilson and just run it back with Mike White? And then Mike White had one of the worst games I've seen last season for a starting quarterback in the next week. So it was. Mike White's a legend in his own mind, and honestly, he is one of my favorite players to ever talk about because of just how stupid it was because of his one win that he got. Cole, you on Instagram. PJ wants to know. Yeah, I am at Cole underscore underscore Thompson. It's a two underscores. <laughs> uh, Hawk says, I'm an a-hole, and I still expect a response. <laughs> Tony G says, go get some cane sauce, guys. I Thanks. probably will because I got to go run up to uh, College Station for baseball today. So um, I'm going to probably need to get some food in my system. There you go. Cole, appreciate you doing this, man. It's safe flight to Indy next week. We will get you on the channel when you get back, and uh, we'll recap everything that you learned. And once again, if you run into Ron Middleton, you have to tell him that we want him. Jets Nation wants him to come on the Jake Asman show. I will tell him that if you want him, you first have to hit it on the like and subscribe <laughs> button. If you don't do that, I can't tell Ron Middleton to hit it on the show. That's right. Please like this video down below. Thank you so much to everyone for watching. If you're new to the show, smash the subscribe button on the right-hand side of the screen. He's Cole Thompson. I'm Jake Asman. Thanks for watching. Back with more Jets content throughout the week. Hope everyone has a fantastic Friday and enjoy your weekend. See everybody.